Welcome everybody. On behalf of the Harris Trust and Selkirk High School, um, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Sue Fletcher Watson, who is from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and she's leading this series of talks about autism and neurodiversity in young people. Many thanks, Sue, and over to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for um, inviting us to come and talk to you all about these issues. Um, as Jane says, I work at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a developmental psychologist and I'm also director of the Salveston Mindroom Research Centre. We have a research remit to understand the kind of educational inequalities and broader life inequalities that are experienced by neurodivergent people. So um, by which I mean anyone who has a kind of learning difficulty um, as a result of um, their brain kind of processing information in a slightly different way to the neurotypical majority. Um, so before we start, I just want to um, recognize that we're all here um, in memory of Harris, who very tragically took his own life last year, um, shortly after leaving Selkirk High. Um, and so, you know, I think the goal of this little kind of sequence of um, evening seminars that we're doing is to try and um, pull something positive out of that tragedy and hope that we can um, learn from that and um, support young people in a different way, maybe in the future. Um, so for this first session, I'm going to be talking about the concept of neurodiversity, what it is and how I think it can be applied. Um, and hopefully it will become clear why I think this is a really important topic to cover um, before going into the next two sessions next week and the week after, which will zoom in more specifically on kind of mental health um, needs and mental health support for young people. Um, so I'm going to define neurodiversity, talk a little bit about how we can use the terminology correctly, um, describe what the neurodiversity movement is, um, briefly address some kind of myths about neurodiversity, and then think specifically how we might apply this concept in schools um, to benefit people's mental health, and how what the implications might be for young people um, and their families. And I'm going to aim to be done by about five to five so that we have about 20 minutes for question time, um, because we really want to give everyone an opportunity to kind of raise questions that they have. There's a Q&A box um, that you can click on to post a question. There's also a chat box, but we'd encourage you to post questions in the Q&A. It just makes it much easier for us to keep an eye on them. Um, my colleague Catherine Crompton is here and she is going to field the questions for us when we get to the end. Um, and I've also got my other colleague, Natalie Jenkins, here to help me answer the questions, and I'll introduce her at the end of the talk. Okay, so what is neurodiversity? Um, here's our, our one sentence definition. Neurodiversity means that we're all different in how we think, feel, and learn because our brains process information differently. That's a definition that we've come up as part of a project I'm doing teaching children in primary school about the concept. Um, so, you know, the idea is that because we're taking in information in different ways and processing it in different ways, that means we behave in different ways and respond to things in different ways. Importantly, neurodiversity is a property of the whole human race, so each individual person is different from the next. But it also explains sort of categorical differences, and I'll go on to that in a moment. The term was coined by Judy Singer, who is an autistic scholar in her PhD thesis in 1998. Um, it's just a portmanteau word. So, you know, neuro comes from neurological or brain based and diversity obviously refers to differences or variation. This rainbow infinity symbol is commonly used to represent neurodiversity because it represents infinite variation. Um, so neurodiversity is naturally occurring. That's one of the kind of key facts. You know, we're all born the way that we're meant to be born and our brains work the way that they're meant to operate. And in that sense, neurodiversity is a really fully inclusive um, construct that, that, um, that really brings together you know, every, every human being. Um, it's aligned with other equality and diversity dimensions as well. So we can think about neurodiversity um, and inclusion and equality in the same way that we think about um, gender diversity or um, sexual diversity or ethnic diversity. So it operates in much the same way in the sense that um, neurodiversity can give rise to um, challenges and disadvantages 
neurodivergent people can be marginalized. And we have a responsibility as a society to overcome that marginalization and that exclusion to make sure that, that neurodivergent people can thrive. So um, in terms of applying this concept, which really at root is just a basic sort of scientific fact, you know, we're all different. I mean, actually it's, it's so obvious, it's almost trivial. Um, but when we start to apply it to human beings, you know, we can see that it is a little bit more complex than it appears on the surface. So as I said, neurodiversity accounts for both individual differences between people, because we are all unique and slightly different from each other, but also categorical differences. So the majority of people we could describe as neurotypical. Many modern systems, including our school system, were set up by neurotypical people. And so they tend to work really well for neurotypical people. Um, but some people are neurodivergent, probably more people than we think. We talk about um, neurodivergent people as a minority, but you know, it, it remains to be seen if that's truly the case. Um, but certainly as individuals, they can struggle to thrive within the systems that we've set up that are maybe not flexible enough to, um, to be kind of tailored to their particular information processing style. I think another really important property of neurodiversity is to reflect on the fact that groups of people with different perspectives working together collaboratively can achieve really fantastic things. So when we talk about neurodiversity in terms of a positive facet, we're not just saying that each individual person brings strengths, we're actually saying that the variety of perspectives that a neurodiverse group brings is in itself a strength. Right, so it's not about an individual person having a particular talent or special ability. It's more about, you know, strength in diversity itself. So I think trees are a really useful metaphor for understanding the concept of neurodiversity and particularly this slightly kind of tricky issue of recognizing individual differences between one person and the next, but also group differences between one group of people and another group of people. And when I talk about groups of people, you know, one group might be a neurotypical group, one group might be an autistic group, one group might be a group with ADHD, for example. So we can see with these pictures of trees that each one is unique, but we can also quite easily classify them into groups. And we can see smaller and bigger differences between these trees, right? So we've got four different kind of soft fruit trees and also a palm tree. And in this group, you might talk about the soft fruit trees as being neurotypical or tree typical and the palm tree as being tree divergent. Um, there are kind of groups and subgroups. There are differences that are more obvious than others. Another really nice thing about the tree metaphor is the fact that different kinds of trees need different conditions to thrive. So some trees need um, more sunshine, some trees need you know, really damp soil to grow in, um, some trees need to grow in a big open space, some trees thrive in a forest, but none of those trees are better or worse than another tree. Um, and in fact, you know, if you ask my mum, who's a keen gardener, she would always say that her favourite plants are the ones that require the most particular care and attention to grow. So how do we use this kind of concept in our everyday language? Um, one thing to remember is that neurodiversity or, or any kind of diversity is a property of groups and it refers to variability between things. So diverse is not a synonym for rare. Someone is not diverse just because they're in a minority um, and an individual can't really be neurodiverse. An individual can be neurotypical, but words that we would use for someone who doesn't identify as neurotypical might be neurodivergent or a member of a neuro minority or neuro atypical. And some people might identify as multiply neurodivergent if they feel that they belong to multiple neurodivergent groups that are separate from the neurotypical. Um, I think the reason why I'm kind of dwelling on the language a little bit is just because I think it really matters. So as I expect everyone is really aware, there is a history of stigma attached to the kind of language of things like special needs. So special needs is a great example, you know, of well-intentioned language that was designed designed to place a kind of positive um, uh, framework over um, children and young people who needed sort of extra support for learning in the classroom, but it quickly attracted stigma so that, you know, describing someone as special became a kind of slur very fast. Um, I think neuro neurodiversity provides us with a kind of um, 
alternative way of using language. And because it's a really inclusive concept that covers neurotypical and neurodivergent people under one diversity umbrella, um, that then um, means that it's less of a, a magnet for kind of stigmatizing um, uh, experiences because it's less othering. It's not sort of drawing a line and saying, you're, you know, you're part of neurodiversity, but I'm not, I'm just a normal person, right? Because we're all part of neurodiversity together. And I think that can help us to emphasize shared experiences and common ground, and also to recognize that we don't actually know someone else's neurotype. We don't know if someone is neurodivergent or not. Um, they might not have a diagnosis. They might identify with a particular diagnostic category, but not particularly want to go down the route of getting a diagnosis. They might have been given a diagnosis which is not really correct for them, or is not the whole picture, there may be other things that would be worth exploring in that case. And so I think by thinking about the way that we're all different from each other, it can remind us that, you know, these diagnostic labels don't necessarily tell us everything that we need to know. And I'll come back to that a bit briefly at the end. I think the other thing um, that we know is that from that neurodiversity reminds us is that just because there is a majority group, in this case, a neurotypical group, that doesn't make them correct or the best group or the most desirable um, status to be in you know being in a majority is not it gives you a lot of power and a lot of influence and a lot of advantage often but it doesn't it's not actually better than being in any other group right instead I think as I've said diversity itself is the kind of best and desirable uh, state of of being um, I wanted to just briefly say something about personal preferences. So here I am talking about neurodivergent people are this, and you can't be a neurodiverse person, you can only have a neurodiverse group. But of course, individual people will have their own preference for describing themselves. And I think it's really important that we always endorse those individual preferences. Um, and, you know, I think it can be really helpful to replicate the, the language that people use about themselves and to know that neurodiversity is a really new concept, even though it was um, coined as a term more than 20 years ago, it still really hasn't filtered into common parlance. Um, and so, you know, lots of people who might technically um, fall into a kind of neurodivergent category won't necessarily identify that way. I would say though that if you're if you're producing kind of policy documents or writing or whatever or for me when I write about my research I try and use kind of correct language to demonstrate some kind of leadership and and to try and bring out some uniformity in how we use these words um, but I have got a little asterisk here about correct language because I do think this is a, a rapidly evolving field and and of course opinions differ um, even on what is correct as well as differing in terms of personal preference. Okay, so ah, this is the halfway point, and I see I'm 12 and a half minutes in, so that seems like quite a good sign. Um, so the neurodiversity movement is something that you might have heard referred to on kind of social media and so on. This is really about the sort of socio-political application of the concept of neurodiversity. So it's focused on things like social justice and civil rights, equity and respect for people who are not in the neurotypical majority and might be experiencing marginalization or disadvantage as a result of, of falling outside of the, of the kind of majority norm. So the neurodiversity movement is really geared towards kind of full societal inclusion for neurodivergent people. A lot of autistic people are really prominent in this movement. And as I said, the word neurodiversity was originally coined by an autistic scholar, but this isn't just about autism. It's definitely much broader than that. Having said, you know, this is a description of the neurodiversity movement. It's also important to emphasize that there isn't a leader there isn't a single organization. There's no kind of unified manifesto or agenda. You know, this is, this is more of a sort of grassroots network of people who are all coming across this concept of neurodiversity and saying, gosh, that's, that's useful. That's a great way of thinking about, you know, some of the experiences I've been having. And I, I think I'm gonna use that to try and make a difference going forward. And that's very much the way that I've kind of come across the term and, and hung onto it myself as well. Okay, so just a few myths about neurodiversity that I thought it was worth addressing as well. One um, risk is that people think that neurodiversity denies disability. So by saying, oh, everyone is different and that's okay, 
it's as if we're also saying, and no one has any problems or needs any extra help, right? That's definitely not what neurodiversity is about. It's about saying everyone is different and that's okay. And they should be able to ask for the help that they need and they should get the help that they need when they need it. Um, even though neurodiversity can be applied in a sociopolitical way, ultimately it's not a political belief, it's just a basic scientific fact. And so in that sense, we can take some of the heat out of the debate sometimes by just reminding ourselves what we're really talking about here, which is just that people's brains vary in how they process information. That means they respond to things differently, they experiencing, experience things differently, and they need different kinds of environments in order to thrive. And that's pretty non-controversial when you strip it back to the, to the bare bones. As I've said, a lot of neurodiversity thinking has been led by autistic people, but it's much broader than just autism. Um, another common uh, misunderstanding is that neurodiversity is all about emphasizing people's strengths. So um, neurodiversity is about sort of finding the unique talents that each, in, in each individual brings to a situation. But I think it is really important, I'm just gonna re-emphasize the idea that it's not about an individual person needing to be skilled in some way. In fact, I think it's very important for young people who might be struggling in a particular area at school, not to feel that they need to find some sort of superpower to be considered you know, worthwhile or an, a valued member of the class or whatever it is. You know, I think um, the value comes from successfully creating an environment where everyone is included and, and, and whatever contribution people bring that is valued. Um, so, you know, people shouldn't feel that they need to compensate for an area of difficulty by, by demonstrating some kind of special talent. Okay, so let's move on to thinking about applying neurodiversity in practice. So I'm just going to show you, I think, a few ways in which the kind of basic properties of the idea of neurodiversity lead us to think about things maybe slightly differently than we have done in the past. So because neurodiversity is a naturally occurring property of the entire human race, that means that there's no one right way to be, there's no correct way to be, there's only more common, more frequent ways to be. It also reminds us, I think, that all the ways in which we're different from each other might not be immediately apparent. So while diagnostic labels can be useful in highlighting when there are particular differences between individuals, um, we shouldn't rely on those to, to, to do all the explaining for us, right? Neurodiversity doesn't make any value judgments about the, the worth that one person or another brings and is fully inclusive of everyone. Um, including people with, you know, profound intellectual disabilities and so on. So the principle tells us that everyone has a role to play in a community. And actually, if we have a framework that suggests that some people are falling behind, we really need to change our framework. Um, we need to remember that diversity itself is what is valued and powerful, not just individual talents or strengths. And I think the last one that I wanted to highlight is that neurodiversity aligns, as I said, with other equality and diversity dimensions. So what that tells us is that the experiences of neurodivergent people are determined by social dynamics, things like prejudice, stigma, um, the kind of discriminatory beliefs that people bring to bear on a particular situation. And as a result of that, for me, for example, as a neurotypical person, I can't fully understand the experience of someone who has a different neurotype than me, who, whose brain is processing information in a different way than I am, and who's having different experiences as a result of that. And so I need to make sure that their voice is in the center of anything I do. I can't work out what would be best for them. Okay. So just before I kind of wrap up, I want to specifically look at what the implications of this might be in our schools, what the implications might be for thinking about mental health support for children and young people, and what the implications might be for, for young people themselves and their families. And after that, we'll have some kind of question time. So just a reminder that you can type questions in the Q&A box. Um, it would be great to have some waiting for us at the end. Um, so please do go ahead if you want to. Okay, so in schools, I think the neurodiversity framework, and, and I, sorry, I should just briefly say, I don't mean to suggest in any way that none of this is, 
isn't already happening in schools, right? Like I think this is this very much aligns with existing best practice, but perhaps encourages us to take it even further. So it reminds us that we need to be person-centered, not diagnosis-centered, because their diagnostic label doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Um, and that we might need to recognize that some people have additional support needs of various kinds in the absence of a diagnosis. I think it, it reminds us that we need to find ways to value everyone's contribution. So if we start from the principle that everyone is equally valuable and that everyone is also different from each other, then we have to find ways to um, think about um, valuing achievements and kind of measuring attainment that fits within that framework. So if we have a metric being used that is systematically discriminating against some people, then we probably need a new metric. A good example of this would be, you know, um, giving um, students points for attendance at school, which is um, discriminatory potentially against neurodivergent students as well as disabled students. I think we could learn a lot in schools from workplace environments. So it's really interesting reflecting on this, thinking about the fact that in the workplace, we have a much stronger framework for understanding or, or utilizing the benefits of a diverse team, right? So we can build a team of people with different kinds of skills and experiences and strengths, and we can recognize how that diverse team that bring different perspectives produces better quality of work, right? They come up with more different solutions. They have to communicate to each other about those solutions. You know, they sort of stress test them more effectively and the whole thing results in a better kind of service or product at the end. But I think in schools, in contrast, you know, we tend to have more of a focus on individual achievements. Um, and so I think it's interesting to think about whether there's ways in schools that we can shift the emphasis onto the, the school or the class as a kind of team working towards shared goals. There's some really interesting work going on at the moment um, in the Autistic School Staff Project, looking at the experiences of autistic teachers. And I think it is really interesting to think about drawing on the skills of your neurodivergent staff in a school when you're thinking about supporting neurodivergent pupils. And I think if we're going to accept diversity and experience and endpoint, we need to recognize that not only are people following a unique path through life, but also arriving at a unique destination. So, you know, it's not just about accepting that, that people have their own way uh, kind of through their school experience, but also that they might have a different endpoint in terms of what school success feels like or looks like for them. OK, so thinking now more specifically about mental health, um, as I've said, you know, the, the neurodiversity framework reminds us that we don't understand someone else's lived experience. And so we need to find ways to capture their own voice and center that when we're putting services and supports in place. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, if we think about neurodiversity um, alongside other kind of elements of diversity, like ethnic diversity or gender diversity, we already know that being in a minority is incredibly exhausting and stressful. And that same thing applies to neurodivergent young people. Minority stress, specifically the stress that comes from being in a minority, we know is a powerful factor influencing mental health in neurodivergent young people. And that's something that the speaker next week is going to talk about in a lot more detail because her research is really focused on that. But there are opportunities that come from neurodiversity that, that that can help enhance people's well-being and empowerment, you know, reminding people that they're meant to be here, that they're okay as they are, that they're valued, that they make an important contribution just by being themselves. I think we can also use neurodiversity as a tool for change. So a lot of the kind of neurodivergent people who have really inspired me are the most incredible self-advocates, campaigners, activists, and I think those skills are really valuable skills that we could be giving to young people. I think we can use our differences in the way that we view problems to help us critically analyze things that are going wrong and also find more creative solutions. So we should embrace that kind of power of neurodiversity in what we're doing. Just briefly, I wanted to say something specifically about labels um, because I think it's, you know, the kind of diagnostic categorization is very important to consider. So, you know, if everyone's unique and different, what does that mean for these kind of labels, diagnostic labels like autism? I think labels can be really helpful, right? They can help us find support and they can also help us connect with people with similar experiences to us. Um, 
But I also think we need to remember that being part of a particular group with a particular label, like autism, for example, doesn't mean that you're the same as everyone else in that group, doesn't mean that that group will always be the kind of primary or most important part of your identity for your whole life, doesn't have to define who you are, though you might find it an important part of your identity, doesn't convey everything important that people need to know about you. And you shouldn't need to be in that group or placed in that group by some external person who gives you that label before people take the time to understand you or support you. If we see that someone is struggling, we should be offering them understanding and support, even in the absence of that kind of, you know, doctor's permission slip that says this person needs some extra help. So I think diagnostic categories can be useful, but they're not the be all and end all. This is my penultimate slide. Sorry, I'm going a little bit over time, but I promise I'll wrap up soon. Um, so in terms of implications for young people themselves and their families, I think identifying as neurodivergent can help people feel empowered in terms of knowing themselves, focusing on an idea of self-reflection and self-understanding rather than sort of fitting in to become more normal and building skills in things like self-advocacy um, to help people chart their own path. I think it can help people find a community, make connections with other people, uh, understand how their life experience fits with others, which can be very validating, but also provide a way to share kind of coping strategies and tips within that community, as opposed to the tips that are sort of um, provided by external people. I think also that community gives people the language to articulate their experiences. So phrases like autistic inertia, autistic burnout are very important to the autistic people I know. And all of that language has been generated within the community. And I think it can help us recognize prejudice when we experience it and advocate for rights, which is such an important part of neurodivergent well-being. So that's me. I'm going to finish now. Um, would love to hear people's questions. And I'm just going to introduce Natalie Jenkins as well. Um, hang on, I'll stop sharing my slides so that maybe we'll be able to see her on screen too. Um, so Natalie is a colleague of mine here at the University of Edinburgh. Her research focuses on dementia and traumatic brain injury. Natalie is also autistic and she and I have been involved in trying to set up better kind of peer support networks for autistic staff and students at the University of Edinburgh. Is that about right, Natalie? Yep, yeah, that's right. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> um, so hopefully we have some questions coming up. I'm going to ask... Catherine, I should also introduce Catherine. Catherine is another colleague of mine from the University of Edinburgh, and she will be leading the third talk in this session, which is talking about peer support in secondary school settings. And I think Catherine's going to help us kind of field the, the questions that are coming up. Sure. Um, so we can start with a question from Jamie that's just come in. Um, so Jamie says, this is excellent. Thank you very much. What small steps might a school take towards creating a supportive ethos when neurotypical peers who may have a significant influence on those who think and feel differently, who wish to fit in, what role can these neurotypical peers play uh, a positive part in support of neurodivergent students? Great question. Natalie, do you want to have a go or do you want me to have a go first? No, you start because I need to work through all of that. Sure. All right, I it. So, I mean, I think in terms of small steps, I think if I was in charge of a secondary school, I don't know if schools still do assemblies, right? If I was in charge of secondary school, I would do an assembly on neurodiversity and I would name it and describe it and give people a vocabulary to understand themselves and each other, perhaps in a different way than the vocabulary that they already have, which tends to, to fall on, fall back on things like weirdo, right? Um, so I think, I think that's what I would do and just sort of confront young people with their need to reflect on um, the ways that they're different from each other and, and, and what that means for them as kind of good citizens within the school. What do you think, Natalie? I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good starting point is to have an assembly on neurodiversity. And it's interesting that the question is phrased as who want to fit in because we've discussed this before and I spent all of my school thinking I'll fit in once I get to university and then I got to university and I didn't fit in 
And I thought, well, I'll fit in when I do my master's. And I didn't fit in when I did my master's. And I thought, well, I'll fit in when I go to work. And I still didn't. And it wasn't until I started being myself and understanding who I am that I was actually able to fit in with other people. So I think by creating an environment where people are free to be themselves and they feel like they can be themselves and that they don't necessarily have to fit into other people's ideal. Because what you'll get if you're if you have a bunch of people who are just trying to fit in, then you get a lot of masking, which is very difficult for autistic people to maintain doing without suffering consequences in terms of mental health. Uh, so another question that's just come in, how can we best support neurodiverse individuals where there is a specific outcome required that may be outside of their individual skill set? Uh, these are hard questions, aren't they? Yeah, and I can't see them written down, so I don't know what... Oh, if you click on the Q&A box at the bottom, can you see them? Who's this question from, Catherine? It's the very bottom one. How can we support neurodiverse individuals? So, well, uh, shall I have a go, Natalie, while you're... Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, I suppose the first place I'd go to is, is, is trying to reassure people that whatever this outcome is, is not the be all and end all of their lives. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we need to take the pressure off any opportunity that we can. Um, and, you know, encourage people to think of the progress they can make towards their own goals or against their own kind of baseline, if you like. Um, I guess the other thing would be, so this is where I'm talking about things like self-reflection tools, you know, trying to encourage neurodivergent um, students in the school to um, take the time to reflect on how do they work best? You know, do they work best in the morning or in the evening? Do they work best in quiet or in a noisy environment? You know, do they, is there um, a kind of creative way to approach whatever the assignment or the task is that fits better with their skills? So, you know, while I keep saying you shouldn't need to have a superpower to be appreciated, which I feel very, very strongly, I do think um, giving people the skills to understand themselves and be able to kind of apply um, that knowledge to their work. So, you know, sort of knowing what, what helps them work best and that it might be different from what makes other people do their best work um, is something that's worth cultivating. And in terms of reflective practice, um, it's probably worth mentioning that some people might need help to learn how to, <laughs> how to do reflective practice because it's something that I hate and I've always hated because I don't know when it ends. So I need help to structure my reflective practice so that I can be reflective without going down multiple wormholes and feeling like it's never gonna end. <laughs> um, so the next question is, how would you square using teamwork to show the value of all types of pupils with a lot of neurodivergent pupils who have difficulties in working as part of a group. I hate yeah. teamwork. I always hated teamwork in schools. So you start. No, 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 you go for it. No, you start on this one and then I'll then I'll um okay. then I'll dip in. I'll interrupt you. Okay. I mean I think this is true and I think the way that we um the way that we uh, set up kind of team working in classrooms is often really difficult. I think one of the reasons it's hard is because, um, you know, it, it happens as an event within a broader school structure that is still about individual achievement, right? So you want to do the best work for your team, but you also want your own individual contribution to be recognised, and that can be really, really difficult. Um, so I would like to see, and I'm speaking more as a parent here, right, in terms of the experiences I've had with my kids in school, I'd like to see um, more focus on, you know, um, being a good teammate. Have you managed to communicate well with other people in your team? Have you taken the time to understand that everyone has the same, the same understanding of the problem, the same understanding of the task? 
um, rather than the, the sort of mark of being focused on the outcome, you know, whatever the team has produced as a piece of work, right? So rewarding teamwork itself would help shift the balance a little bit. Um, I think the other broader thing in terms of thinking about the whole class as a team is, is that, you know, if you think about the whole class as a team uh, uh, trying to achieve, you know, some sort of well-being goals, that might include, you know, well done, Natalie, can I pick on you, Natalie? Well done, Natalie, you knew you were a bit stressed and so you decided to leave the classroom and go for a walk in the playground and that was exactly what you needed to do and that was great for the whole team, right, because it was better for Natalie and better for everyone else in Natalie's class. So, you know, that sort of shifting our perspective um, in terms of what we consider to be a good outcome might help. And I love your idea about teamwork being about how did you perform as a team member? Because I think I probably would have learned team <laughs> how to work in a team better if that was the actual objective. Because when the objective is an academic output, then especially for intelligent pupils, you, you want, I, I would have just completely taken over the group and said, we're doing absolutely everything that I want to do because you're not as smart as me. And obviously that doesn't come across very well in a team. But in my mind, I would have always been thinking, but that's what's best for our team is we produce the best work. And if that means we do all of my ideas, then we've met the objective of the teamwork. So I think that's a really good point is that actually, if the objectives had been, how did you work as a team, then that would have, I would have understood the objectives and I think I would have performed a lot better, but I hated them. I absolutely hated them. It's funny because we just spoke about that on Saturday. We did. We did. <laughs> um, so someone else is asking, uh, their child has a, um, a lot of issues with sensory overload in school um, and it's a large school with between 700 and 1000 pupils. They're asking how can a school work to reduce these or how can they support their child to overcome them? Um, shall I go first again, Natalie? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, well, uh, with apologies if these are things that you've already tried, but I, I'll make some suggestions. The first one I would do is, um, is to make sure that you're having a conversation with your child about their sensory overload and naming it and explaining it to them so that they can reflect upon it and have some kind of thoughts about it. Um, it might be useful to talk about situations that they've been in and maybe situations where they've they've more successfully managed their sensory overload um, and it might be worth if, if you have those experiences as a family you know you go bowling or um or to a noisy like indoor swimming pool or something um you know th this is something i've i've heard a lot from parents is that their children's sensory profile can seem to to go up and down and it might be worth sort of saying say how come that was okay you know that seemed to be fine that noisy swimming pool what could we learn from that that might be relevant for school um i think um there are obvious kind of you know um things like having something to fidget with you know noise counseling headphones um uh, all of those sorts of things you know maybe a little kind of lavender cushion or something that smells nice to smell to overcome nasty smells um you know, wearing kind of dark tinted lenses, sunglasses or something, you know, um, could really help. So all of those sorts of things to try and mute some of the sensory input. And I think creating an environment where it's okay for him to just go and spend five minutes walking around the play playground in the fresh air, you know, if it gets too much. Um, or alternatively go to a classroom if it's break time and you want a little bit of peace. Yeah, 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 absolutely creating a kind of quiet space or a, you know, a more sensory, comfortable space. Um, and also allowing them to take their friends into the classroom with them at break time if they want to, because that's one of the things that teachers used to do for me. I actually didn't get my diagnosis until I was an adult, but even when I was at school, I didn't like, I didn't always like being in the playground. So the teachers, a few of the teachers that knew me quite well would let me go into their classrooms. But if I had friends with me, they'd throw us all back out again. And actually, 
a more inclusive environment for me would have been able to say, you know, bring some friends in with you. You don't have to be alone because you need a little bit of quiet time. So that that would have been useful. And also I was just thinking one of my issues is that because uh, I'm quite sensitive to light, but I don't always recognize that that is causing me a problem until I'm out of that situation. And then I'm like, oh, actually the light or somebody turns the light off and I'm like, oh, actually that's so much better. I don't always realize that any issues that I'm having at the time are because of sensory overload. I don't always recognize it myself. I don't know how you would deal with that in school. Do you have any ideas, Sue? Um, I mean, I guess you've just got to commit to a bit of experimentation, you know, oh, I can see that that something's not right here. Let's see if we, you know, sat you in a different spot or, yeah, turn the lights off or, you know, we. it's just flexibility, but it's so hard, you know, and I recognise for any teachers, you know, you, you can't stop your lesson halfway through and spend five minutes faffing about with the light switches, right? It, that's really difficult. Um, but you know, perhaps sort of saying, why don't you come in for five minutes or, you know, come in to school five minutes early or stay back for five minutes and we'll systematically experiment with things in our classroom until we find something that's working better. You know, is there a better chair to sit in or, you know, should you be further away from the window or the door or, you know, that sort of thing. That's um, a really good idea, Sue. And because also, if you ask me at the time, what's what's wrong? What can I do to help you right now? I probably wouldn't be able to answer you and because I would don't always recognize what it is that's causing it myself. But that's a good idea. Trial and error on a, on a break time or something. OK, um, so Laura has said uh, that having the people's voice at the center is, is really important. Um, but quite often pupils can find this difficult to do because the forum uh, in which we are kind of asking for their opinions does not take their neurodivergence into account. Um, and she has asked on what your thoughts are on how they can be more inclusive with this. Um, I mean, this picks up exactly what Natalie was just saying, you know, that, that if you put someone on the spot and expect them to, to immediately kind of know and have that insight, um, that will be really difficult um, for most young people and I, I expect especially for neurodivergent young people of, of various kinds. So I think it's it's got to be a sort of longer term process. Um, and that's where, you know, transitions between school years or, or from primary to secondary school, you know, are so important to get right. So that that those personal relationships that are so important and that understanding of each other isn't lost in the in the handover. Um, I mean, I think, you know, um, tools like drawing pictures of, of things, you know, drawing pictures of your feelings. Um, uh, I've seen a therapist do some lovely work with those kind of mag magnetic words, you know, you get like magnet poetry you can stick on the fridge. So the words are all ready for you and you just can sort of put them out of a bag and, and, and make a group of words that, you know, that sort of reflect how you're feeling about something. So, you know, sometimes this, the, the pupil might not be able to present a kind of fully formed description or, or a fully formed solution, um, but they might still be able to express something of their their feelings and their experiences that you can then work with them and to interpret and understand. Um, what do you think, Natalie? Yeah, and I, I always feel it's easier to do when I'm given options for my answers. If, I, if it's a, a time where I'm finding it particularly difficult to say what I need, then if I have options, that's a lot easier for me to answer. Yeah, I mean, just to pick that up that's something I've found very difficult often working with neurodivergent people is not wanting to restrict the available <laughs> responses right so but then equally if it's a sort of blank sheet of paper you can tell me anything then that can be completely paralyzing for people yes yeah, very yeah. much so. and 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 so one thing to flag if you are giving options is to always have a other option you know a sort of none of these options work but at least at least you're then making a a start on the conversation, you know. Or even having like examples, like this is an example of what I would put based on how I'm feeling right now. And then that shows me what I'm supposed to do. 
Do we have time for one more? I have time for one more. I guess mm -hmm. people can leave if they need to get going. But yeah, I'm when... just aware that we were meant to finish at quarter past. So yeah. should we do one more and then and then end there? That sounds great. Okay, great. So uh, Ewan has asked, within a group or team environment, how would you suggest uh, starting a neurodiverse group discussion or, or kind of discussion about awareness so that no neurodivergent people feel singled out? So you're all asking very good questions. Um, so I suppose, I mean, I suppose this is one of the reasons I just really love the concept of neurodiversity, because you can talk about neurodiversity and it, it, it includes everyone. And so you don't have to be kind of singling people out. Um, so um, how would we start neurodiverse group discussion and so that no one felt singled out? I mean, maybe something like starting with a book group or, or you know, so a, a an experience that is not an experience of anyone in that group or in that class or in that school, but is still an authentically neurodivergent experience, right? So um, this is one of the things that Catherine and I have talked about doing is kind of building a resource of, of um, you know, materials that we could recommend to neurodivergent young people to start to explore their identities that could include some kind of, um, you know, novels or comics or whatever. Um, for example, there's a book that just won the Blue Peter Book Prize called A Kind of Spark, which is written by a neurodivergent author about a neurodivergent lead character. And so, you know, that provides that might provide a jumping off point that um, is a bit more distance from people's personal experiences, but um, but still authentic and, and a basis for a conversation. Um, what do you think, Natalie? I think that's a really difficult question, but I like I like the point you make that everybody in that group is neurodiverse. So in in and that's a great way to start that kind of conversation because then it doesn't single out everyone. Everybody in the group is the same. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we should probably draw to a close because you know we do want to keep to time. People have busy and stressful lives, especially right now. Um, I'm going to try and save these questions and I'll maybe see if I can jot down some answers and send them to the organisers and ask Natalie to have a look at them um, for anyone whose question didn't get answered. Um, and I see that Jane's written in the chat, um, you know, this has been recorded and it's going to get posted up and there'll be a session a week from now specifically looking at neurodiversity and mental health experiences. And then a week after that, Catherine will be leading a session um, looking at um, peer support models for neurodivergent students in secondary school. And we will have Q&A sessions um, with some uh, wonderful neurodivergent people at each of those as well. So thank you so much. And I hope this has been a little bit useful. Thank you for your attention and your excellent questions. <laughs>